The following interview was conducted with David E. Nichols, the Robert C. and Charlotte P. Anderson District uh, Professor Chair in uh, Pharmacology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, August the 4th, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Nichols, and good afternoon. Tell us a little about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Uh, I was born in Covington, Kentucky, just across the river from Cincinnati. Uh, my parents both basically came from farms. Uh, my mother from down in Kentucky, my father from eastern Kentucky, and uh, I had three brothers, and we were all raised by a fairly stern, demanding father who expected a lot from us. We were very disciplined little kids, and uh, he instilled values of perfectionism, I guess. We always had to do things right, so we had, he had high standards for all of us. And, uh, what was high school like? <coughs> Any activities or student organizations? High school was an interesting mix of people because there were people that came from the older section of Park Hills, which came from very wealthy families, people from the section where we lived, which was mainly populated by families who had come back after World War II and the Korean War, and then uh, lower income families from farther out. So there was kind of a gamish. And although I normally would have mixed with the more wealthy people because I lived in Park Hills, I was actually on the other side of the highway, so to speak. So I didn't really have a lot of social connections. Um, in high school, although I went to school with those kids all the way from first grade on up through senior high. Really my later years in high school, um, some of the people noticed me because I was taking all the advanced chemistry course and advanced physics and <clears throat> sort of the, the science geek. And uh, they suddenly realized, who's this guy, Dave Nichols? We've been going to school with him for all these years and he's been in all of our classes and we just never realized who he was. So I. Uh, Really, the first activity that I got very involved in was uh, when I got in the senior play. I had never done any acting, and a lot of the people were in the drama club and so forth. And so I just, on a lark, decided to audition for the senior play. And the director of the play was my advanced chemistry teacher, Mr. Richardson. So I read one of the parts, and I ended up with the male lead. And that was a lot of fun. And I've been to some of the high school reunions, and they say, oh, that was great. You were in the senior play. It was so much fun. And, that was really my senior year, so I really started, I guess, growing socially and becoming more outgoing and interacting more with the with my classmates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then what came next? You went. To, where'd you go to college? Now? I started where off in engineering. <coughs> Cincinnati. Started off in engineering at University of Cincinnati. My parents uh, were not well to, well off, shall we say? We didn't know that as kids. We thought everything was fine, but they basically scrimped and saved every penny, and so going to college was uh, something that there really really wasn't much of a plan for. And if I went to University of Cincinnati, they could pay the first quarter's tuition. And then I could co-op after that. And if I lived at home and commuted, then it would be a fairly inexpensive way to go. And my father had said, this was post-Sputnik, my father said, oh, there's a big demand for engineers. You like chemistry, so go into chemical engineering. And not knowing any better, I went into chemical engineering, which really was not chemistry at all, but was math. And math was not something I particularly enjoyed. And I stuck it out for two years and finally said, you know, this isn't what I want to do. I want to do chemistry. And uh, I then dropped out of engineering and uh, started working in industries in Cincinnati area. I uh, had a variety of positions in process research and, and analytical labs and development. <coughs> in the Cincinnati area? Cincinnati area. A lot of industries there. <coughs> and uh, then I decided to go to night school and keep up with the school until I could save up enough money to go back to school full time as a chem major. But in the interim, I got married, then had a baby, so that was not possible. So I finished my bachelor's degree going to night school. So I worked, you know, full work week and then went to school from basically 6 to 10, 15, four nights a week for five and a half years. So I pretty much was burning the candle at both ends to get through. Um, but you made it. I made it. Yeah. I graduated with my BS in chemistry in 1969. Okay. And then what came next then? Then I went to graduate school in medicinal chemistry at the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy. Okay. How did you happen to select them for the graduate? <clears throat> Do you know somebody or, or one of the professors? Well, I had become interested in um, drugs that affected the mind, and there weren't many people working in that area. And the, the head of the department, Joe Cannon, was working on uh, compounds for the military uh, that would produce hallucinations and would disorient the enemy troops, so to speak. So I decided that would be interesting, and I went there actually to work for him. But when I got there, um, there was another professor who he and Joe Cannon had not had had ceased the activity in that area, 
and was working on uh, another kind of compound that I wasn't particularly interested in. But they had another professor, Charles Barfinek, who was still sort of dabbling in the area of uh, hallucinogens, what we call hallucinogens now. And uh, I got really interested when I talked with him, and I had a fellowship, so I could work with any of the faculty I wanted to. So I decided to work for him. So you continued your research. You finished up there then, huh? Yes. Yeah. I started in 69 and <clears throat> basically finished my research in the summer of 72. Um, graduate school for me was really kind of like a picnic. If you imagine that I'd worked full time, had a baby, and gone to night school for five and a half years, when I went to graduate school, all I had to do was to take a couple of classes and do research. So it was really much less of a burden than my life had been prior to that time. So I finished the project I had for a master's degree in about my first semester. Um, I finished up, well, more quickly than anyone else ever had there. My thesis was thicker than anyone else has ever had been before. And my professor was trying to push me out of the door before I'd even been there for three years. He came in the summer of 72 and said I should write my thesis up. And I begged him to let me stay because there was another compound I wanted to make. So he said, OK. So I stayed the fall. And then he bugged me again. And I said, well, let me try to get this one last reaction. And then he came to me about mid-semester and said, look, write it up. You got enough. So I wrote it up, defended it, and then I uh, finished and went over and started a postdoc in the pharmacology department, uh, the first of 73. Okay. So officially, I graduated in 1973, but my work was all done really in 72. Okay. Now, your family were with you at that time? Was your yes, wife, I had a wife was she and, in school, uh, too, or she finished? My wife started working part-time, and then she actually got a degree in physiological psychology. That was my first wife. And we had a son we took with us, and then we had a, a second son that was born in 1973. Okay. So you had your family then with you. Yes. So well, um, <coughs> what was your career path then prior to coming to Purdue? Uh, well, I... did you come to Purdue right after I came that? right after. I did okay. a postdoc in pharmacology. Uh-huh. And um, they had a faculty member here who had left, had gone sabbatical and decided not to come back. And they did, Here, was, meaning Purdue? At, at Purdue in MedChem. And they had decided to replace him. Uh, they had interviewed senior candidates, but none of them looked very uh, acceptable. So what they did is split his senior position into two junior positions. And uh, I interviewed for one of those positions. And they wanted someone who had a very biological perspective to their chemistry. And so with my chemistry BS, my med chem PhD, my pharmacology postdoc, I fit right in and, and really was conversant with the biology end of things. Okay. So that brings us to Purdue. Let's talk a little bit about that, about the teaching when you were here. and then move into the, some of the uh, research that you started or continued on that you'd already begun? Well, when I first came, I taught organic chemistry. And actually, I got the teaching award when I was teaching organic chemistry, which is fairly difficult to do because the pharmacy students typically don't like organic chemistry very well. Um, I taught that for a few years. And then we had the other candidate that, that was hired at about the same time I was uh, slightly later, Mark Cushman. He was teaching in medicinal chemistry, and he really wanted to teach in organic. So after a couple of years, we switched. And he started teaching organic, and I started teaching medicinal chemistry. Um, the research that I started with was actually a continuation of what I did for my graduate work. When I was a graduate student, <coughs> Charles Barfnick had dabbled a little bit with some uh, analogs of uh, mescaline metabolites. This was a psychoactive drug, but really had not gotten into the field. So when I worked for him, I really developed that whole field myself that I published I don't know, 12 or 13 papers as a graduate student in that field. So when I left, it was really an area that I had developed, although he uh, had been formerly my mentor. But he wasn't going to stay in the area. So when I came to Purdue, I just kept on doing that. And that was the first grant I got funded. Mm -hmm. so what was I, funding like in those days? It was a lot easier to get. Of course, the grants were smaller, but um, you they were more willing to take a risk. The first grant I wrote had a lot of speculative hypotheses in it because it really wasn't known a, much about the structures of these molecules and what the relationship was to their activity. So I could propose some things that today would just, I mean, they would throw them out of the review section yeah. because they want now they want things that are almost a guarantee. But it, it's, they were still difficult to get. You had to write well. Uh, they had to be well documented. You had to have the, the chemistry schemes had to be documented. They, you know, they couldn't find any obvious flaws. But you were allowed to speculate a little bit more about what might work and what might not work in terms of the overall uh, gist of the project. And I had funding up until <clears throat> last year. So that's been from about 76 until 2008. I had continuous funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse to study the relationship between the structures of hallucinogenic molecules and their biological activity. Okay. Okay. And <clears throat> because that was a subject that no one else was really interested in commercially, I was kind of in a bind. Um, 
if I'd gone into any cancer drugs or anything, any viral, almost any other kind of drug, I would have found collaborators who were doing research in the biochemistry or the pharmacology of these drugs, and I could have collaborated. Because of the area that I chose to work in, there really was no one to collaborate with. So what I had to do was basically create my own pharmacology to go along with the medicinal chemistry. So I started working with uh, smooth muscle from guinea pigs and rats, and then we worked with cats and mice and rats, and over the years built up a repertoire of pharmacology to the point where actually I became, well, my, my chair is the Anderson Chair in Pharmacology. <clears throat> so I'm recognized as much as a pharmacologist as I am as a medicinal chemist. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know where, maybe more nowadays even more of a pharmacologist. But that was out of necessity that I had to create the pharmacology program to test our own compounds. So I still do that. I still have a program where we do pharmacology, in vitro and animal pharmacology, that couples with the, the uh, synthesis and design aspects of it. Okay, okay. And you, you, uh, you're working with the, uh, you said one thing I read, to understand the role of your brain, monamine neurotransmitters in normal, normal behavior. Right. Okay. Sure. So there's a, the monoamine tra neurotransmitters in the brain are norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And all of those transmitters are very important for the action of uh, psych psychoactive drugs. Uh, there are others, acetylcholine as well and some, but uh, dopamine, for example, is the principal transmitter that's involved in the, the stimulant and rewarding effects of drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. Right. And I've done some work in that area. Serotonin <coughs> is principally the transmitter system that's involved in the action of hallucinogens or psychedelics, whatever term you want to use. And norepinephrine, we really don't know a lot about its role in behavior, but it clearly plays some role. So I basically have looked at uh, the drugs in terms of how they affect those systems, dopamine and serotonin. Do they increase the activity, decrease the activity? Do they block the receptors or do they cause the release of the transmitter? And all of those affect behavior, the way people feel, the way they perceive. And so, what is the role of those transmitter systems in behavior? All right. What about, are you doing clinical studies as well? Or no, the clinical studies that I'm involved in really don't occur in my lab, although I've been involved in planning and implementing, especially through the Hefter Institute, and to a certain extent with Dar Pharma. Um, but I don't run any clinical studies, right. no. Okay, okay. <coughs> the, uh, and also, you, um, the intactogen, that you coined that to the, uh, describe the unique physiopharmacological effects of MDMA. Would you talk, tell, comment yeah. about that? Um, that's been cited a couple of times in some of the research that I checked. Yeah, MDMA is an interesting psychoactive drug that really came on the scene in the early, I'll say, 1980s. Um, and I knew a lot of the psychiatrists who had used it in an unapproved way prior to its being scheduled. So when MDMA first sort of came on the scene, it was not a controlled substance. And physicians were allowed to prescribe things in the course of their own practice if they made them or if they were extracts from plants they made. So physicians had a lot of latitude. So there were a lot of physicians, particularly in California, who had heard about this substance and had made it and gotten samples and were using it to treat their patients in psychotherapy and various types of therapy. So I was invited to a meeting uh, at Esalen in 1984 where they had all the people who had done anything on this substance and they knew that the Drug Enforcement Administration was about to, to try to schedule it, make it a controlled substance. And they were trying to think of ways to prevent that from happening because they were convinced that this was a valuable tool for therapists and psychiatrists. <clears throat> and I was invited as a scientist because we looked at some of the effects on brain monomines and done a little bit of the work. So when I talked to the people that were there who had actually used it, the stories were fairly impressive. I mean, there were therapists who said, you know, I had this woman in therapy for 10 years and I never could reach into whatever her problem was and I gave her a dose of MDMA and all of a sudden she's telling me that she was abused as a child and all this stuff was coming out and suddenly everything made sense and so I made years of progress in just literally an hour. I thought, wow, you know, if this is true, uh, there may be some potential here. But because the drug had become so wildly popular and was being used at raves and, you know, it was going to be scheduled, I realized it could never be developed as a commercial medicine. So what I thought was, well, let's see if there's a way we could develop something that would do the same thing but wouldn't have its genesis in the street market. And the first thing I realized was that <clears throat> politically it had been uh, cursed by being called just another hallucinogen. And from what I knew of the pharmacology, I wasn't convinced it was just another hallucinogen. We did a couple of studies and we published them where we pointed out that MDMA was not 
just another hallucinogen. It had chemical structural features that excluded it completely from that class. It was something different. So the issue was, what, is it, what does it do? How is it different? And I thought, politically, it would be good if there was a name that distinguished it from the hallucinogens or psychedelics. So you could say, it's this other thing. And we tried to, I tried to think of a word that would sort of capture what these psychiatrists had told me it was doing. So I talked to people who knew some etymology and thought about lots of different names and finally came up with intactogen because in uh, connoted an inside and tact came from the Latin tactus and gen was the Greek generation. So it was generating a sort of touching within. There was actually a debate because at that time the, the other term was empathogen that was being used. And I said, well, it doesn't sound to me like they just produced empathy. And if you say empathogen, you hear the pathogen, it sounds kind of like it's nasty. So right. we actually had a debate with a guy named Ralph Metzner about which was the better term. In Europe, intactogen is most widely used in scientific circles. In the U.S., it's sort of a mixed bag. The counterculture tends to use empathogen. The people who do the science work use intactogen because intactogen is sort of a more respectable term. That was kind of fun, and the Oxford, Oxford International Dictionary people called me and said, well, we're putting that intactogen in the dictionary, and you coined it. Can you tell us about it? So it was kind of fun <laughs> to think, oh, I invented a word. Um, I think there may still be some potential there, but we, we got into a pr program where we tried to see if we could reproduce the effects. And what it is is a situation where you have a substance that does a lot of different things. And when you change its structure, everything doesn't change in parallel. Things change in disproportionate ways. And so it's, it's almost a, a unique drug, just like people are unique. And we never were able to really uh, create anything that we thought was comparable in medical utility. We did a lot of interesting work on determining what were the structural relationships involved, the individual pieces of the activity. I had a student who did a lot of work on the neurotoxicity that that drug produces at high doses, at least in rodents, really mapped out. And it was related to how the drug actually works, but <clears throat> sort of gave up in that field. I had funding to, to work on MDMA and related compounds for, that was a third grant I had running concurrently for about 12 or 13 years. And I finally just gave up when it was clear that the only thing that the government agencies were interested in funding was uh, studies on the neurotoxic properties, the negative aspects. If you wanted to Their try to... Their focus has shifted. Yeah, the focus. If you, wanted to do, if you wanted to understand how it worked in terms of the psychopharmacology and how it might be useful, there was no interest in that. And I was getting the message on that on the last grant. I'd send it in, and they basically were beating me up for why aren't you studying the toxic effects, blah, blah, blah. And I said, that's it. I'm not interested in why the drug is toxic. I'm interested in how it works. Right. So that was, I had three grants for a while, and that was, mm -hmm. that was one of them. <clears throat> Do you have any contact, with, you, any liaison with the FDA at all over your over time, or not? Um, or do you, you never done any consulting for the for FDA, with FDA at all? Not with no. FDA, no. Yeah. What have been in some of your consulting activities? The Most of the consulting I've done, and especially recently, has yeah. been in intellectual property issues. Okay. Um, the first consulting that I really did in, in a large way was for Eli Lilly on a drug called Prozac. And what happens is when the drug companies have a big blockbuster that makes three or four billion a year, it doesn't have to be that, but typically that's what they've gone after. <clears throat> the generic companies try to find flaws in the patent so that they can attack the patent, uh, have the patent invalidated, and then they can market their generic versions. And they do that. Rather than waiting until it expires. Yeah, they, all, they do it to all the big drugs now, every single one of them. And I didn't actually testify in that case. I was an expert that worked with the Lilly attorneys to help them craft a case and, and develop questions for other um, experts from the generic side. But then when um, the same thing happened with Zyprexa, which was a drug to treat schizophrenia, and they retained me for that and I actually testified in the United States and Canada and UK and worked with, worked with their attorneys in Germany and in uh, the Netherlands on the same case because it was being attacked a lot of different places. <clears throat> Successfully, they've defended that patent so far. Um, and some other ones are related to Aseroquel, which is another drug to treat schizophrenia, and Abilify, which is another drug to, create, to treat schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And these are all cases where the generics have said, well, anybody who was in the field at the, t at the time who was skilled near it would have known this was an obvious drug to make, and so it really wasn't novel and shouldn't have been patented. And they're really ridiculous arguments, but um, 
you still have to fight them back and yeah. you have to defend <coughs> it all the way yeah right yeah talking about teaching uh talk about what your work with the iu school of medicine here on campus for the research of the west lafayette campus uh are you still still doing that and what uh, yes. courses are you teaching um, <coughs> I teach in courses uh, in, there's a uh, pharmacology course for the second year students in the second semester and I teach the psychotropic drugs. So these are the antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, mood elevators, uh, drugs to treat anxiety. So they're all, I teach the drugs basically that affect mood and behavior which is sort of allied with my interest. Yeah, yeah. just the second year then. Um, I talked a little bit about funding. Let's talk about some of the, can you make some comments about some of the patents that you've gotten and uh, successfully, yeah. uh, the challenges that that you're faced when trying to the first apply patent, for those. Yeah, the first patent I got was actually as a graduate student. Um, these hallucinogens, one class of them are called hallucinogenic amphetamines. They're really the structure of amphetamine that has things stuck on it. And to really understand how they work, you need to know what these separate isomers do. And so these drugs occur in what's called a racemic mixture. It's like you have a left and a right hand. They're both hands, but they're right and left mirror images. Right. You have the same thing in biological molecules, organic molecules. And so with the amphetamines, you essentially have a right and a left-handed one. And the left-handed one is the one that actually has the biological activity. But the right, the sort of the other one, has different effects. And uh, they were always studied before as a mixture of the two, and so it complicated. And I just stumbled sort of on a way, well, I'll say stumbled, but stumbled on a way to do that as a graduate student, which we then patented. And actually, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse provides those isomers to researchers free of charge, and they use the method that I developed. As far as I know, that the last time I checked, they did. We actually tried to see if we could get some royalties a few years ago, and they got all upset because they didn't re didn't realize it was a patented method. And then they found, and then they realized that well, they'd never charged anybody, and they never never made any money, so there were no royalties. That was the first one. <clears throat> but then most of my patents have been in the dopamine D1 agonist area, and that's an area I started working on when I came to be actually, but it was working on drugs to treat uh, shock. And then it developed into a focus on the dopamine receptors in the brain. What kind of shock would they be treating those for? Well, when you're in an accident, if you have a, like lot, a, trauma of, shock? a lot of hemorrhage, okay. your blood pressure drops. And one of the things that happens is the blood vessels in your kidneys constrict to try to decrease the volume of the vascular bed to raise the blood pressure. And when they constrict, they they restrict the, f the flow of blood through the kidneys. And of course, that's the blood that brings the glucose and the oxygen to the kidneys. So what you would have is renal failure secondary to hemorrhagic shock. Um, and uh, there was a fellow at University of Chicago named Leon Goldberg who was trying to find new drugs to use to treat people in shock to prevent kidney failure. And I actually got a small grant from him in the late 70s after I got here to work on those kinds of drugs. And that receptor in the kidney turns out to be almost identical to the brain dopamine D1 receptor that, that I subsequently focused my efforts on. So that's sort of how I got into it. And interestingly, when I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa, the fellow that I worked for, Charlie Barfnick, only had three or four graduate students. The department head, Joe Cannon, had about a dozen or so graduate students, and they were all working in the dopamine field. And so it was my habit to find out what everybody was doing in the whole department. So I knew what all of Joe's students were doing. I knew their research and I knew the backgrounds and why they were doing it. So when I came to Iowa, I knew the dopamine field as well as I knew my own serotonin field. So when I connected with this associate of Leon Goldberg's, I said, oh yeah, I know the dopamine field really well. And so that sort of led me to continue what, although I hadn't formally done it as a graduate student, was a sort of secondary interest that I had maintained and knew a lot about. Yeah, sounds good. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, <coughs> Hefner Institute. The Hefner Institute. And how that came about yeah. and your role in it. Um, I was convinced at a certain point that these drugs, hallucinogens, might be very useful in psychiatric practice. They, you hadn't, I hadn't seen con good controlled clinical trials, but it was clear from some anecdotal reports that people had, had some pretty amazing things that had happened ha when they'd taken these substances. So <clears throat> I thought, you know, we, what we need are good clinical trials. All the work, after LSD was discovered, there were thousands of papers published, thousands of clinical trials, where psychiatrists raved, they could do this, they could treat autism, they could treat schizophrenia, I mean, everything under the sun. But the trials were not controlled and well done. And I realized you really had to do good clinical trials to see whether they had any value at all. And so <clears throat> I used to go to scientific meetings, and we'd be having a beer in the hotel restaurant, and 
we'd be talking about this and I'd say, somebody needs to do research on these and see, you know, is there anything there? I mean, it was such a big splash and then it just sort of was shut off. And they'd say, oh, you can't do, you can't do research on these things. And I'd say, well, you can. You just can't get the government to fund it. You need somebody. You need private money. You need to get private funding and you could do it. There's no reason you couldn't do it. Oh, no, 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 no. And I told that story over and over and over and I said, well, in the beginning I, I told the story. I said, you know, all you need would be an endowment of like a million dollars and you could set up an institute to study these things. Well, as the story went on and the years went on, pretty soon it was two million and four million and five million and got to be ten million. And I don't know, sometime around 1990 I was sitting telling the story for the umpteenth time and I said, you know, I'm going to be 75 years old, retired, sitting in a rocking chair telling the same story. And I hadn't done it because I didn't have an MD. You can't do clinical studies with an MD. Mm -hmm. So I called a bunch of my friends who were psychiatrists who had MDs and said, hey, let's do this. They all got very excited and enthusiastic. And so in 93, we incorporated the Hefter Institute. Okay. Did you get some fun how did you get some funding? It's all been private. I mean, we, okay. in the beginning, we had a, a fellow named Bob Wallace who was, I think, the ninth employee of Microsoft. And he supported us to the tune of $100,000, $150,000 a year for many years before he died. And that allowed us to sort of become established. And now we sort of, it's a, we're a virtual institute, so we kind of go hand to mouth. Uh, we'll encourage people, if they have a grant, if they have a proposal for a research project, we'll send it out and get it peer reviewed, make suggestions on how they can improve it, how they can make it better. Uh, we have some small studies that we fund at a very basic level. We serve as sort of the focal point as a not-for-profit to work with them and if people want to fund the study then they can give us money and then we'll support sure. those studies. Yeah. Um, we've actually published quite a few papers w from investigators that got funding from the Hefter Institute. Um, on our website, hefter.org, there's a whole list of research publications. We have also a laboratory at the University of Zurich where Franz Wohnweider is. There's actually a, a Hefter Clinical Research Center there and we he uses that money to leverage a large amount of money from the Swiss National Science Foundation. He's sort of the world's top clinical researcher now. And he's doing some really amazing clinical stuff with PET imaging and EEG, et cetera, and correlating brain states with brain chemistry. So it's really nice to see that. It's not uh, where I wish it was. We don't have that. We haven't had that big benefactors come in giving us the endowment to, to right. leave us funded. It's located in New Mexico, is it? New Mexico is where it was incorporated. Yeah, and okay. the medical director, George Greer, sort of runs a lot of the day-to-day. -day. He lives out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the, the other thing, you have a publication that uh, you issued that Hefner Review. And the Hefter Research, uh, yeah. Hefter Review of Research. Yeah. We had two of those, so we're pretty nice. And um, <laughs> we thought about doing a third one a couple years ago, and everybody said, well, do we fund research or do we fund the bulletin? And people said, well, everything's online. Well, if we want to do it, let's just do an online thing. And it's a shortage of manpower and funds. We haven't done the third one. Those were nice little reviews. Right. Um, that were written in a kind of scientific American style by people like myself and, and others in the field for the common person. And people generally, they were well received, but it's, uh, you know, there's only so much, only so well, many hours other in a day. Too. And, yeah. Right, exactly. <coughs> and then the other one was that Dar Pharma that you have. Dar Pharma. Yeah, yeah tell us a little bit about that. And that was um, a collaboration uh, with a, a fellow named Richard Mailman, who was at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. <coughs> and the D1 agonist, we published a study in 1991 showing that a dopamine D1 agonist was as good as the best therapy in Parkinson's disease. Um, and we had tried to license it <coughs> first to a company called Interneuron, and uh, they had simply used it to boost their stock prices as far as I could tell. They could never commercialize it, and then they dropped the ball. Then I had a second compound, and that, that was with dihydroxidine, the first one. I had a second compound we call I called dynapsline. And Bristol Myers Squibb worked with that for a while and licensed it from Purdue briefly. Um, and they uh, kind of goofed up one of the tests where they were at a point a decision point, a go no go, and misinterpreted one of the tests. <coughs> and so they dropped the license. And so Richard went to England and was working in a laboratory, the guy who had done this test, and he found out that, you know, in fact the compound worked really well. They had just misinterpreted their early results. So he called me and said, let's start our own company. I'm tired of working. And we'd also worked with another German company briefly that almost signed a license and then backed out because they had a change in leadership. So it had been three companies that had come in, played with the D1 field, and then had sort of backed out. So he decided to start a company. And I said, Richard, I, I don't know if I have the time for this. 
He said, I'll just be on the scientific advisory board. I'll do all the work, yada, yada, yada. So he sort of tried. He didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know what he was doing. We hired a CEO who didn't know what he was doing. We hired other people who didn't know what they were doing. And the company limped along for several years. We did get a CEO named Prabha Fernandez, who was really good at the very end and tried to resurrect things. But there had been so much sort of bad publicity. I mean, if you go in and see an investor, you get one chance to make your spiel. And the fellow we had who was making those presentations was really botching them up. And then once Prabha came in, she couldn't get back. They said, we've already heard about the company. We're not interested anymore. She did the best she could, and it was finally um, merged out into another company, which became defunct and basically nothing okay. happened. Okay. I really am still convinced that if we can get one of these drugs out there, that they will work in Parkinson patients where nothing else works. Because of the way they work, they will work long past the time when most therapies stop working. What's happened now is uh, there's a lot more interest in the effects on working memory and cognition. Mm -hmm. There was a researcher at Yale named Patricia Goldner Keish who died in a tragic accident a few years ago, but she showed that D1 agonists can improve working memory and cognition in monkeys. And so the belief out there now is that in schizophrenia, uh, these deficits in working memory and cognition are the big problems that can't be treated. And so there's a lot of interest now in going back and commercializing some of these drugs that some of the D1 agonists I developed to use in treating schizophrenia. Probably within the next year, we'll see whether those efforts are yeah. successful. Well, the drugs and things that you've worked on and, and the, the growing with the senior people in the geriatrics and a lot of them like the Parkinson's and the dementia and things of that sort, um, and Alzheimer's, there's quite a challenge. And oh, yeah. try to work and hopefully that some of these drugs, some names that you mentioned, the, the name you hear advertised, you know, for some materials. It's a real, ch it's a big challenge, and now with people living longer and having, and the memory thing is, is one oh, thing yeah. that is a concern to a lot of people. Well, I'm 64 now, so if I go up to somebody and say, you know, I forget people's names, and they say, oh, I do too, and um, right we now. We have junior moments. Yeah. <laughs> the, I do that. We all do that. That's the, okay. The <laughs> FDA approves drugs for pathological conditions. So if you have Alzheimer's, everybody's scrambling to come up with something to treat yeah, Alzheimer's. Right. But if you just have normal lapses of memory, there's no drug for that. But everybody that I know says, you know, if there was a drug that could give me back that memory, I would buy it and it would sell a lot of money. So uh, that bothers people oh, yeah. when they're way up. You, you, well, you've talked to people and so have I. It just What's his name? I should know I should know this person's name. I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to fake it until I can remember what their name is. Right. I, I think it's uh, I think there's a market there I think like a lot of these drugs, it, it, they may call it a, a lifestyle drug, but it's really not. It's not a lifestyle drug. Right. If you have a memory deficit, there are things that you can quantify, and then you say, well, they'll come up with some category for uh, age-related cognitive decline. I mean, that's already a category, but they'll, they'll then quantify it. So if you have it at this level, then it would justify treatment. I think what will happen is they'll find one of these drugs that improves cognition and memory for some uh, pathological condition like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's, and then they'll try it on someone or it'll get off-label and they'll go into someone who doesn't have that and if it improves cognition, and what you'll see is a proliferation and you'll get to that point, but it'll take a while. Sure. How do you think your field has changed since you've gotten into it? Oh, it's completely different. Okay. Um, and your role has certainly impacted that. Well, <laughs> one would hope so, but um, in the beginning, what I did was really more of a gut feeling like what you should make and how good you were depending on how good your your instincts were about the molecules to make and how well you understood the targets. And now it's uh, computationally driven and bioinformatics and they're mining big databases because finding new drugs is so difficult. Um, finding a drug now means first identifying what the target is and then validating the target and then finding drugs that only activate that target and don't produce toxic effects of any kind in anyone. And they're so stringent uh, in terms of the requirements for new what drugs. What has caused that? Why it's so difficult? Well, it's a, I think it's because our society is so litigious. We have so many attorneys. You develop a drug for the majority of people. If you mm -hmm. think of people being in a normal curve, you right. develop a drug for that person who's in the middle and you go one or two standard deviations away. But you have these people out in the end that are hyper-responders, people that die after they get a dose of penicillin even today. Right. or people that have severe reaction to aspirin or whatever. You come out with a new drug for treating some condition and 
25 million people take it and it works fine and two, two, two or three people die of some kind of a liver problem. All of a sudden the drug is suspect. And it's probably unrealistic to find a drug that doesn't do anything at all like that that's adverse. But that's part of the problem. Because people have different makeup and it can affect... Yeah, uh, completely. There could be, you could be one of million and, and you just happen to be the one that right. it had the, the adverse effect on. Or and if, it, if, it's, if it's your 17-year-old son who's treated with this new drug and he dies, then you sue the company. And so everybody's afraid to get in there because of the ramifications. Sure. Um, a lot of controversy over the price of drugs today. Right. But if they, if they really do shut down the U.S. drug discovery process by taxing it or regulation, whatever, um, and there's some waste there they could probably trim up and become more efficient, but if they really shut it down, we're, we're the country that leads in discovery of new drugs right now. So you'd sort of see the pipeline sure. would really dry up. And that's what's going on now in major pharma. They're all merging because the pipelines are drying. They don't know how to discover the drugs. They don't know how to find the targets and how to validate them and how to find a drug that will hit that target. Um, Computer-based drug design, I mean, we're doing that in my lab now. We've got models of receptors that we've got computer-generated models and <clears throat> we take drugs and we see if they fit in and how they fit and can we correlate how they fit with something else. Um, Does that make it something a little <clears throat> bit easier that's a help? Well, Think it, no, it, oh. it gives you a deeper level of understanding. Okay. Whereas before we could talk about, well, the drug binds in some way to the receptor. Well, now we can say, well, the drug fits in between these alpha helices and the nitrogen binds to this aspartate in helix 3 and these, the hydroxy binds to serine you know, 242 in helix 5. And so you now have a deeper understanding of how they're binding and maybe how the activation process is occurring. But I wouldn't say it's really gotten us to a point where we can actually use that to design new right. drugs. That's another help along the way. Yeah. Right. The, sort of the ideal is a st what's called structure-based drug design. If you actually have the molecular structure of the target, you know the target you want, you have the structure of it, you know what it takes to activate it. In theory, you could develop software programs that would dock different molecules and construct mm -hmm. molecules and would fit and be complementary, but nobody's really there. Yeah, I see, okay. Um, the, uh, let's talk about the Psychoactive Substance Research Collection. And for researchers, this is currently in the Purdue archives, um, special collections, the Virginia County cards. Just talk a little briefly about that. How that came about? The that was uh, <clears throat> a project of Betsy Gordon. She actually was on the board of the Hefter Research Institute and uh, realized uh, that there was no source where researchers could go to get all this information that had been published about work that had been done on, on hallucinogens over the years. It was fragmented. There were, it was primary literature here and there, and people had private libraries and so forth. And I guess it was her dream to put it all in one place and so that researchers could, could study it. And I think, in a sense, she's visionary because up until almost the present time, there hasn't been much awareness that these substances were really that important other than in the counterculture. But I think people are starting to see now that these things may be very important, interesting research tools. And for example, when you think about the question of consciousness, what is consciousness? What does it mean to be conscious? What is consciousness? Is it a process? Is it occur in some part of the brain? 10 or 15 years ago, you couldn't study that. There was no money, no funding for that. It was sort of a taboo subject. And now you have cognitive research, research cognitive neuroscience. You have researchers studying what is consciousness. And if you were living hundreds of years ago and you were a philosopher, it was a perfectly respectable profession to speculate on right, Plato, what is, right. what is consciousness? And you can't make any money as a philosopher today. But I think human beings still have this need to understand who they are and how they fit into a scheme of things and where do we come from and where are we going. Those are questions that always interest me and I think interest in most people if they think about it. Most people are just so busy and with their everyday lives they don't really think about it. And if in pharmacology if you want to study a system, the way you study it is to perturb it. So if you want to study how the heart works. You find drugs that affect different receptors or mechanisms that regulate heart rate and you put them in and you see what they do and that helps you to understand how the heart works or the blood pressure system or the kidney or whatever. So if you want to understand how consciousness works, you're going to have to perturb consciousness. So these drugs are the best tools for perturbing consciousness. So I think they will, over time, as we become maybe more 
mature as a society and realize these are really important questions and you can kind of put aside the drug abuse hysteria and everything from the 60s and say, well, you know, they're really interesting compounds. Right. People, ask, uh, people have asked me, and I have a standard answer for this now, it took me a while to formulate, but people ask me, well, why did you, why did you study LSD? What's interesting about it? And so what I would, my standard response now is I said, well, think about the things that can change your life. Um, you fall in love, you get married, you have children, uh, a parent dies, a sibling dies, a child dies, um, you get a divorce, or you take LSD. And they'll stop, what? And I see, that actually is true though. How is it that a substance can diffuse into your brain, stay there for three or four hours, diffuse back out, and you may never see the world exactly the same way again? How is it possible that a chemical substance can do that? And that's a really interesting question. And, I would think so. Yeah, and people say, wow, that's right. And the thing that surprises me is that more people are not trying to understand that. What, is, what actually happens? Because it relates to who we are and, and consciousness and perception. So. Let's see. Is there many people going into the field, I mean, similar to what you're doing? There are a lot of people who would like to. Okay. And I get letters all the time, and I've had people write to me, how do I get into the field? What, the problem is what do I need to get to? Yeah, there's just no funding. Um, what I tell most people today, a lot of them are chemistry majors, and they mm -hmm. say, oh, I want to do what you do. And I said, you know, there's no interest in the chemistry of these things anymore. The really, the, the really interesting questions are in the pharmacology and the neuroscience. How do they work in the brain? What do they do, and how do they affect perception conscious? That's really neuroscience, neuropharmacology. It's not chemistry. So I tell those people, I said, get, a, get an MD degree, or get a PhD in biochemistry or neuroscience and then get an MD or something, focus on the biology of it. Um, and that's such a long road to hoe that not many people do it. Yeah. There's a lot of interest, and I think a lot of young people <clears throat> will still experiment with these substances and get very interested in studying them. A lot of the people now who are in their 50s or 60s who are in neuroscience, and especially in serotonin research. I gave a talk at the serotonin club meeting years ago an after dinner talk, and I looked around the room, and there's 50 or 60 people. They're all focused on serotonin research. And I said, I would hazard to guess that the majority of people in this room are interested in serotonin because A, they either experimented with psychedelics, B, they knew a friend or someone who experimented with psychedelics, or C, they read about them, were so impressed by the descriptions that they thought this was interesting to go into. And all the heads are going, you know, I don't know who is doing what. I have a friend who went into psychiatry because he said he was taking LSD and he was finishing his BS and he didn't, his, or his bachelor's degree, and didn't know what he was going to do with the rest of his life. And he was taking LSD and this big neon light lit up in his head that said, go into psychiatry. And he's a psychiatrist today and he's enjoyed it. So it worked. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's talk a little bit about um, your awards. Start with the distinguished chair that you received and how did that come about? And was it somewhat of a surprise, or it's a nice yeah. accolade? <clears throat> yeah. Um, Do you know the uh, the name of I the chair? I didn't. I didn't. They, I are didn't they know. living? Yes. Oh, well, okay. their uh, their father and mother, Robert and Charlotte, had passed away. He was a pharmacy school graduate, I believe, uh, in the class of 1931. Okay. Toxicologist Eli Lilly for for all of those years, and his family decided to endow a chair in memory of of him and of the his wife. Yeah. And they wanted um, they wanted to the chair to be in pharmacology, and so uh, I was enough of a pharmacologist, I guess, with the grants and papers that they decided sure. I was the appropriate candidate. Yeah, they're a very nice family. I enjoyed meeting them, and it's a great honor for me. Right? Was he? Did he graduate from Purdue in the pharmacy? Yes. And then went to work for Lilly. Yes. Oh, okay. Any other awards that you care? You gotten some teaching awards. I got the, the uh, nice. The Heine Distinguished Teacher, Best Teacher Award in back in the 80s when I was still teaching organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, in 2004, I was named the Irwin Page Lecturer of the Serotonin Club. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, that's an inter international club of serotonin researchers, and so they pick one person who has been sort of exemplary and done a particular type of research. And so I went, was uh, invited to go to Porto, Portugal and gave a plenary lecture there, and that was a lot is of fun. Is this a, uh, every, you continue to be that lecture, or is it just on some no. lecture things that's only for one year yeah. and they have somebody else? Just one year, and, and they okay. do it every, they don't do it every year. It's every okay. every few years, and um, I think there may be a more, a rapport 
Maurice Rapport lecture as well that they alternate. But uh, right, yeah, I think I asked him about that. Yeah, uh, it's well, very I nice because they're all your, all your colleagues that worked in the serotonin field and they know what you've done and they know your contributions. Right. What about professional associations? Which one do you still keep pretty active in? Um, the one that I'm probably most active in is the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, ACNP. It's a relatively small organization that's primarily academic psychiatrists. And these are all the opinion leaders and top researchers who study uh, affective disorders, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. There's no chemistry at those meetings. Um, and I go to those meetings every December. And they talk about advances, you know, how drugs compare. And I really use that to get a perspective on some of the things that I should focus on. Where is there a lot of interest in the clinical community? What are the problems with these? How can I understand them? And sort of translate that back to the extent that I can into the the work I do with rats and, and chemistry. There aren't many chemists in that organization. It's very exclusive. You have to apply for membership and there's a credentials committee and uh, you have to write a big long statement and they look at your papers and they look at your history. And you get peer reviewed to get in there, right? Basically, it's very <laughs> difficult to get into that. So uh, I feel kind of lucky there. There aren't that many chem chemists Right. that are in that organization. Yeah, that's a good good combination for you. And we talked about consulting. And you've done some work with government research review groups. To make yeah, a I've, well, I've studied on, I served on study sections, lots of study sections. Okay. I was on a regular uh, study section for, for many years. And then that's so much work. That, and they keep coming back and they'd ask me. I still, I get invitations all the time to serve as an ad hoc reviewer because I know chemistry and biology. And there's so many of the reviewers that just know chemistry or just know the biology and can't do the synthesis right. of the two. So I've been pretty popular. So I kind of pick and choose. If I'm really busy, I say I just don't have time for it. And if I, I've got time, I'm going to do it. But I get, I get those requests a lot. So I do that sort of as a service. But I don't really want to be in a regular review group anymore. It's just too <laughs> you much You can pick work. and choose. Yeah. It's better. Yeah. Let's talk about family. Did you have your children? Did they come to Purdue? They both, uh, oh. came, my youngest son uh, graduated from Purdue and he has a degree in communications and he's a TV, he works at TV2 in Greensboro and he's an editor, production manager. He does the work, With I think. Greensboro in North Carolina? Greensboro, North, it's a Gannett station, TV2. Okay. And he films, edits, writes scripts, he does promos, all kinds of stuff down there. And then my oldest son uh, is the, uh, he'll, he's an assistant professor at LSU in the medical school there. They tell him he's sort of their rising star in the department, and of course you know he got the, this press release on his research with his first big grant. My understanding is he'll be promoted this year there. He's doing a promotion document, and he thinks he's going to be an associate professor. So that's uh, very that's satisfying. Um, I joke about us starting. Did he go to Purdue as well? Yes. Oh, okay. He actually graduated with a bachelor's degree with honors in from biology here at Purdue. Okay. Started in chemistry and then switched over to biology. I told him, I said, you don't, I don't want you to don't do what I'm doing. You should do what makes you happy. <clears throat> Don't follow Dad. <laughs> yeah. He told me once, he said, I said, you know, I never pushed you to go into science. I always told you you should do what you want. What makes you happy? He says, no, Dad, you, you biased me. I said, how? <clears throat> he says, well, let's think about it. When I was little, did you give me baseballs and toy trucks and stuff? No. You gave me a microscope, a telescope. <laughs> I said, well, those, no Lincoln logs or Legos. No, I said, well, those were the things that were interesting. Well, <laughs> and I hadn't even realized that I had sort of biased him. He did not forget. <laughs> yeah, but he's a good scientist. He's a he's a good scientist. That's good. Uh, how about an outstanding event in your life? Anything come to mind that you'd like to share with us? Outstanding. I mean, other than the Anderson chair or well, something. Anything. Like that. <clears throat> That's I have to be with Purdue. It's, I mean, it's open ended. Oh boy. Don't know there have been could. a couple, I'm sure. The, well, the Anderson is one you certainly was, cite. Yeah, that was, I yeah. mean, uh, those awards have been those that, and and being selected as the as the page lecturer, those were those are big words. The funny thing is, I tell people that I think if I'd gone into heart research or cancer research, I'd be getting all these awards. But because I went in to study psychoactive drugs, you know, it's I didn't plan to be a martyr, but I think. Uh, in actual fact, it's almost like that. Nobody recognizes the importance of these things. And it's been really my personal devotion because I was convinced there was something here and nobody, they were being ignored, that I really focused a lot of energy on that. And so I probably have given up a lot of awards by choosing a field okay. that everyone would consider, you know, yeah. so strange maybe. That's okay. And the closing remarks, I'll leave it up to you as you look back or look ahead. 
any summary comments that you'd like to share? Well, as I look back, the and ahead too as well. Huh? Yeah, the choice I made in graduate school and the the accidental finding that Barfneck, Charlie Barfneck was there doing something that just was perfect, and that I had a fellowship and could do what I want, and that that I'd worked so hard already working with the family and going to high school, that graduate school just was like, I got all those publications and everybody considered that I was the top student in the department and one of the top students that ever had graduated. And then I got the position at Purdue and as I look around at other places, I think, wow, it was really lucky I was here because they had an infrastructure, they were building a research department. I wasn't hammered with so much teaching that I couldn't do research. We had good facilities and a good right. reputation. And uh, you know, of course, they've been able to been able to recruit good students. I've gotten the best, some of the best students that came into the graduate program. I look back and think I've just been incredibly blessed by all the things that happened to me. And it all kind of came together, which is great. Yeah, yeah. And to look back and um, you know, I don't know where the Hefter Institute is going to go, but we've got we've got three clinical studies now where we're using the active ingredient from psychedelic mushrooms to treat uh, dying patients. And the first study we completed with 12 patients, we got really remarkable results. We got a big study now at New York, New York University. It's all basically to look at finding new ways to treat people, improve the quality of life. And I'm looking at some of these things going, you know, in a couple of years, if this stuff all works, I can look back great. and say, you know, none of this would have happened. The renaissance, the, they say there's a renaissance in the study of psychedelics, but the renaissance is because I made MDMA for a preclinical study in 1986, and that's what everybody uses. And I made Rick Strassman's DMT, and so that got everything started. And I made psilocybin for the study at Johns Hopkins, and none of these things would have happened. And I don't ever go around telling people about it. They just see them happen. They don't know that, well, Dave did this in the background and, and enabled it. So it's kind of, I wouldn't say I feel like a godfather, but in some it's sense. Very it's, rewarding. In some sense, looking at like all these things are happening now, and nobody knows that I was really behind the scenes doing a lot of these things, but I was. So it's it's satisfying to right. see when I really retire and sit back and see these things if they keep growing and going and developing, and we see new medical treatments and, and better understanding of psychiatric disorders and the D1 stuff. If you know if it actually works in the clinical trials where they're testing it now and improving memory and cognition, and it, then we start being able to improve the lives of schizophrenics. I can look at a lot of those things and feel like I left my mark when I'm gone. That's right, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. It's I really pleasure. appreciate that. My pleasure. <laughs>